Hey, this is Richard Chismar. I'm the author of Becoming the Boogeyman, and you are listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show Podcast. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. You know, this time of year, we always have the big events that happen, pumpkin patches and haunted hayrides, haunted houses, and uh, studio uh, hauntings it's like Universal and um, that kind of stuff, as well as, of course, when we have... Um, movies that are coming out specifically for Halloween season, as well as uh, re-releases of classics and films we like, and some cult classics. And one of the things that caught my eye this year was one of the streaming services. Of course, there's Shudder, and there's Screenbox, and Tubi has their horror um, films and TV shows that they have. Um, But the one that kind of stood out to me this year was the Criterion Channel. Now, if you're not familiar uh, with the Criterion Channel, it is uh, related to the Criterion Collection, um, those uh, specialty uh, movies that are released on now Blu-ray. Uh, they started their own channel many, many years ago, and I was actually one of the lucky ones who beta tested uh, the first version, which was called Filmstruck. And Filmstruck was sort of like a uh, uh, kind of like a Turner Classic movies, and then you had the Criterion section that was a part of it. Uh, it lasted a few years, and then it became the Criterion Channel. And um, when you subscribe to it, you know you get all of the uh, Criterion movies in rotation. Um, I haven't gotten the new version, but I know on the old version you had uh, some movies came with the um, extras and um, some didn't. And uh, but anyway, uh, what caught my eye was their um, huge amount of 90s horror and classic horror that they're having this year. Uh, Ironically enough, of course, with uh, the In Search of Darkness 1990 through 1994. Uh, that I talked about on my previous podcast with director David Weiner. Um, Criterion Channels here has 14 90s horror movies. Um, so you get Death by Temptation, Exorcist 3, Frankenhooker, Body Parts, The Rapture, uh, Dust Devil, When a Stranger Calls Back, In the Mouth of Madness, The Addiction, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, Ravenous. And then um, you're going to get in November Bram Stoker's Dracula, Body Snatchers, and uh, then they're going to come out with Event Horizon in December. That's a great one. They're also doing uh, techno thrillers, um, which uh, Westworld, uh, The Net, Dark City, uh, Existence. Uh, it looks like these are sort of sci fi uh, horror. And then they have Art House Horror, uh, 30 uh, Art House Horror movies. Uh, easy for me to say. Haxon, uh, the 1932 film Vampire. If you've not seen that, I highly recommend it. It is a non-silent, silent movie. <laughs> um, Eyes Without a Face, of course, the classic French film. Um, Carnival of Souls, uh, Hour of the Wolf. I always like going back to that one. Um, that's a great one. Um, Night of the Living Dead, of course. Spirits of the Dead, Fellini. Um Flesh for Frankenstein, Andy Warhol, and Blood for Dracula. Uh, Just a whole bunch there. And um, then they're doing something called Pre-Code Horror. And those are going to be 1930s movies that uh, were released before um, you had the Hollywood production code. So uh, these are sort of, you know, riding a line, very risque movies. So uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the 1931 version, Svengali, Dr. X, uh, Freaks, Island of Lost Souls, which of course we know is uh, Island of Dr. Moreau, Uh, The Most Dangerous Game, Murders in the Rue Morgue. Now I'm going to have the Iron Maiden song in my head the rest of the day. Uh, The Old Dark House, great Karloff movie. Uh, 13 Women, Murders in the Zoo, Mystery of the Wax Museum, The Black Cat. That might be my favorite Lugosi Karloff film uh, of all time. Uh, And The Raven. Some great stuff there. So if you um, if you don't have uh, Criterion Channel, just take a look at it. I don't know uh, how much it is a month, but um, take a look. See if it's uh, worth your time and your money. 
uh, to join, maybe for a month, just to uh, gobble up all these great horror films that are currently available on there. As you heard at the top of the show, author Richard Chismar is going to be here in just a moment to talk about his new book, Becoming the Boogeyman, which is a sequel to Chasing the Boogeyman. Uh, Richard's uh, an accomplished author, to say the least. Uh, He has also uh, worked with Stephen King, both as um, a co-author and uh, working with uh, adapting uh, King's fiction to the screen. We'll get into all of that in just a little bit. Um, I want to mention that our friends over at Fright Rags um, are doing something very cool. They've been doing it for quite a while. Uh, They have been doing Kickstarters uh, for board games that they've been creating. So the new one that they're doing is called Ghostface, the game, based on, of course, the killer from the Scream series. Now, this will be the fourth game they've done based on key holidays. So the first one was uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. The second one was My Bloody Valentine. The third, Halloween 2. And now this one, which is Ghostface. There is a ton of information here. It would take me an hour to get through all of it. Uh, But this one, of course, he is the icon of Halloween, the ghost face. And um, this is what they call the Stop the Killer uh, game series. Now, if you're familiar with Fright Rags, you know the amazing art that they do for their shirts. Well, they brought that amazing art to their games. And you can go to Fright Rags to read more about this and see more about this. It's Ghost Face the Game, and uh, it's... As they say here, it's a, uh, a new tabletop adventure where players try to stop up to three killers in different ghost face masks from overtaking a drive-in theater. Sounds great. And right now, they're doing really well with getting money brought together through Kickstarter. So you can go to Kickstarter. You can check out Ghostface the Game. Uh, there is just a ton of information on here. Um, they have nine different ghost faces that you can use. Um, they have double-sided game board. The artwork is just fantastic. So check it out on Kickstarter. It is Ghostface, the game. And a reminder, if you missed my previous podcast with In Search of Darkness, 1990 through 1994, director David Weiner, uh, a reminder that the pre-order for the film is available through Halloween, and then that's it. So make sure you check it out at 90shorrordoc.com. That's 90s-h-o-r-r-o-r-d-o-c.com, 90shorrordoc.com to find out more about uh, the different um, swag bundles available for In Search of Darkness 1990 through 1994 pre-order. And if you missed my interview with David, go back one podcast and you can check that out. And if you're not familiar with the series, um, there's tons of interviews with David here um, on the podcast as well as on YouTube. There's an entire In Search of Darkness wing for uh, In Search of Darkness on the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel. But now it's time to get to my guest. As you hear in the background, we're adding a new grave. And when that happens, that means my guest is here, and it's time for me to get to work. Joining me now is Richard Chismar, who is a New York Times, USA Today, and Washington Post best-selling author of science fiction, horror, and fantasy books. Richard co-authored Wendy's Button Box, a best-selling novella with Stephen King. Richard has also edited more than 35 anthologies, and his short fiction stories have appeared in dozens of publications. And his new novel, Becoming the Boogeyman, is available starting October 10th. Richard, thank you so much for joining me here on the Graveyard Show podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, before we get into your latest book, Becoming the Boogeyman, I wanted to ask when you knew you wanted to become an author. Oh, man. Um, I was really young when I started, like, you know, messing around with writing my own short stories. Um, you know, I want to say, you know, eight or nine years old, I was writing like little monster stories in, in those old uh, spiral notebooks, you know, that you had for school. And I was writing, like I said, monster stories and war stories and trying to pawn them off on my friends for a nickel a piece. And, and they would never they would never pay up. So uh, <laughs> my, my mom was my first paying, uh, my first paying audience. Nice. 
Uh, you know, it's always, parents are great. You know, they can really help you know, push things forward when, when, when you kind of hit a wall, that was really sweet of her to do. Um, yeah. you know, cause that could have maybe have gone a different way. Right. Um, well, I was just going to say that, that, you know, good parents, you yeah. know, I was going to qualify by saying good parents, because I'm sure there's, there's probably a, a you know, a, an unfortunate amount of parents who, who, you know, would have said, you know, stop messing around, just like kids who read comic books and stuff, you know, stop messing around and, and get you know study your math homework or go outside and do something productive um you know so yeah, yeah i was fortunate that they kind of embraced that weird side of me it, it, exactly and and it's so true right because you know that, like you said some parents could just be like you know go do this go do that don't don't why would do you want to do that and i'm sure there are a lot of kids out there whose dreams have been squashed because they just you know they never got that encouragement and it's so important for parents to really you know support their kids when they're you know when they're at an age where they're trying to figure out what they want to do and and it, it, it does mean all the difference um so when you were young and you were writing these stories like what were you, what were your favorite things to watch or to read like what were your influences even then um you know that was the thing I, people have said you know did, did do you think you were born with that you know in you or or you know where did it come from and i i grew up i was the youngest of five kids and and everyone in the family was, were big readers um including my parents so you know trips to the library were a big deal and uh i was a weird kid i was like outside playing baseball and football and trading baseball cards and doing all the normal things but at the same time man you know saturday at noon when creature double features you know came on television um it was always the first showing was at noon the second one was at two i was gone from whatever i was doing outside i was back in the house watching that um same thing you know back in the day you you didn't have the uh you know everything revolved around the tv guide that's how yeah. you when things come in and i would always scan the new tv guide and see when there were scary movies or having costello beats the mummy or whatever it was and uh <laughs> I'd get my butt home. So, uh, yeah, I was reading, you know, horror comics and Twilight Zone and and, and all that and, and, you know, watching uh, whatever I could see, you know, anything that was scary, you know, or, or weird stuff. You know, I was into like Bigfoot and all that. Um, so, yeah, I was a weird cat right from the beginning and um, kind of shaped what uh, what I eventually you know, really focused on. It is amazing how much of our childhood does stay with us or at least – well, maybe not all of it, but I mean, you know, we have, I think for those of us that remember those days of TV Guide and, and watching television and reading comic books and going out and playing um, before the Internet and this whole, you know, different digital world that we're now in. Um, I agree. I, f- I mean, I feel like I'm very fortunate as well because I don't know in this day and age if oh, how, how, how I would have done in a digital world. I guess there's stuff you can find and stuff like that. But I mean, going out and playing and, and, and doing all that and then having the counterbalance of being inside and watching TV, um, it really is it really is interesting. Um, I'm wondering if from this from this part of your life, looking at kids, uh, how do you, how do you look at that in terms of how, like how they're growing up? Um, you know, it's interesting because with, with, uh, chasing the boogeyman, which came out a couple of years ago, um, you know, it's a really nostalgic telling of a serial killer story. I mean, I, you know, one movie producer described it as, uh, the wonder years meet Psalms of the lambs. And I thought, uh, I, I loved it when I heard that from my agent. And uh, it, in my kids, you know, I have two sons. They both read it. And I, I mean, you know, one came back to me and was like, oh, my God, Dad, all those stories that you and your friends tell, they really are true. And I was like, yes, you know, we told you that. And then the other one was just like, you guys just ran around the neighborhood like a pack of feral children. And I'm like, yeah, that too. Because it, 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 was, it was so alien to him that, <clears throat> that all of my closest friends lived on the same block and in many cases on the same street. Um, and that essentially, you know, we would wake up in the morning and go outside, find each other, um, knock on doors sometimes or just, you know, wait until we saw them. And then, uh, you know, we'd be back for lunch and then we'd be back for dinner and then we'd be out again and we wouldn't be back until, you know, uh, certain parents either called us in or we had a pre, you know, determined yeah. time to be home. But it was just, you know, we ran free. Yeah. And uh, we didn't have cell phones to text our parents and tell them where we're going to be. A lot of times, of course, they'd ask and you'd say, oh, I'm going to Jimmy's house. But that lasted 15 minutes. 
Yeah. And then we're, the next six hours, we were all over town. You know, we were on the roof of the gas station. We were, you know, at the elementary school. We were in the woods behind the post office, you know, all of that. And, and your parents really didn't have a clue. So, yeah, it, it kind of opened their eyes to how different it was then. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure to your to your children, they're like that. What 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 planet were you living on back then? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of funny because it's it's what, what do they call it? turnkey? We we're the the turnkey uh, generation or something. Where you yeah, know, you, all right, you know, mom and dad would be off to work, and it's like, okay, don't burn down the house, and we'll see you back for dinner. <laughs> it's like, okay, great, and off you went. Well, and, that, and that was the interesting dynamic. It's like you know, for instance, my mom didn't work. She was a, she was a, a housewife. Uh, my best friend, um, well, one of my best friends, same thing. His mom, his mom cut hair in the basement, so she had appointments sometimes, but she was always home. Right next door, you know, our other best friend, her mom worked, you know, on the proving ground, and you know, in the military base. Uh, uh, lots of the moms worked, lots of them didn't. So it was just interesting. But there was always an empty house. There was always an unsupervised house to uh, hang out at if we wanted to. And again, th- that you know just an alien world nowadays yeah one of the things i read you um mentioned was during thanksgiving and how uh king kong and thanksgiving uh were sort of uh i don't want to say one and the same but how you relate to king kong and thanksgiving um because of the triple feature that they used to do at least in new jersey that's where i grew up we used to have the triple feature of uh kong the original king kong son of kong and then mighty joe young on thursday Mm -hmm. And then Friday was Godzilla triple feature, so they would usually show like you know Godzilla versus the Smog Monster and then whatever the other two were um, on uh, Channel Nine and WWOR. So I, I thought that was really cool. Someone else had mentioned that uh, somewhere. It's like nowadays they play the Twilight Zone all day on New Year's Day, you know. So yeah, there, there were always those kind of landmark appearances. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself uh, going back to King Kong on Thanksgiving now? <laughs> Oh, I have. I have. I'm I'm a sucker for for the whole, you know, sense of nostalgia. I, you know, I was fortunate that I had a, uh, a you know, a, a really good childhood. I mean, plenty of, uh, you know, plenty of it's just interesting because, uh, you know, I'm a big family, um, big extended family, uh, you, you know, plenty of deaths along the way and miss, miss, you know, and accidents and, you know, various things. I had a, a full you know, adolescence and, and childhood, but it was also very much, you know, when, when people talk about kick the can and playing flashlight tag and, and, and fishing in the creek down the street and all that stuff, that was my childhood. So, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, why do you, why do you have such a strong attachment to it? And I'm like, because it was a great time in my life. I mean, I've been blessed. So it, it, it I, I've had a pretty fortunate life. I've been able to do what I love to do. Um, I've never really had a, a, a real, you know, job where I work for someone else and, and I have a wonderful family and wife and I've been married 30 something years, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I've been a fortunate guy, but it, it all started back then. And it all started with, you know, my, my family and my siblings and my friends. So yeah, I'm always looking back. I'm always, you know, it's like I, I tell people, I'm like, cause they talk about a certain toy or a certain something from their childhood. And I'm like eBay, eBay is your Anything you can think of, it might not be on there today, but it'll be on there next week or next month. And and uh, so yeah, in my office I have lots of little, you know, bits and pieces from my childhood. Some of it, you know, the original, that that for some whatever reason I hung on to. But in some cases, just replacements. But they're nice to look at and pick up once in a while. I'm right there with you. I always find myself going back sometimes because you know finding stuff just to, just to remember. I, I don't know the Sears catalog popped in my brain not too long ago. When you used to get the, you know, the, was it the summer and the winter catalogs? And, you know, you oh, open yeah. them up and you're like, oh, what's coming out for Christmas? And you see all the toys, you know, as a kid. And you're like, oh, I want that and I want that. And <laughs> it's funny you said that because, you know, I have TikTok on my phone just to waste time. And, I, you know, I, do, I post some stuff or books on there from time to time. But just yesterday, for the first time ever, while I was just kind of, you know, swiping up and down, you know, looking at stories, um, they had... Uh, digital um pages in there from the sears catalog oh wow and, and it, from different years and one was 1983 when i graduated high school another one was 1988 which was the first year uh cemetery dance started and it was and i talk about this a lot in my writing I'm, you know i i my often used line is you know it's like stepping into a time machine but that's really what it was like i flipped through you know each each one had probably a dozen pages and i'm looking at 
I'm looking at, you know, radios and I mean, you know, little uh, Ford Apache from yeah. like 19, you know, 83 with the little figurines and stuff. And I'm like, man, I had that probably five years before that when I was in middle school. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. The guns in Navarone. I used to have. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. oh, the big, the big mountain. Yes. Oh yeah. That thing, that thing got used. <laughs> and, and you know what? You can hop on eBay right now and, and there's a dozen or so of those. Cause yeah. I've seen them. <laughs> uh, nice. <laughs> well, speaking of cemetery dance. So in 1988, you did start this magazine called cemetery dance. Love the name, by the way, of course, graveyard show cemetery <laughs> dance. There you go. Uh, so uh, what was it like getting that off the ground? Oh, an adventure. I mean, I was a senior in college, um, young and dumb and full of energy and, and, and just rolled with it. I mean, there were real, no, you know, there was, uh, it was the, it was the kind of birth of desktop publishing. So it was, you know, I had my little Mac with the like five inch screen and, and, uh, I don't even remember what kind of saw page maker, maybe software okay. and, uh, learned everything on the fly. And, uh, yeah, it was just an adventure. I mean, it was every day was something new, a new challenge, and it was a lot of fun. And I, you know, I, I was just so excited to be doing something that I loved that uh, it made all the, you know, the mistakes and, and, and the, the speed bumps and the, you know, the cliffs that we drove off of a, a whole lot easier to take. And, and uh, yeah, a big learning process. But uh, yeah, it was it was exciting. And, and God bless David Silva, who published a magazine called The Horror Show um, back then, and it was it, it was a big deal. But Dave was just a great guy and uh, answered a lot of phone calls for me and, and gave a lot of advice. So what is the difference between being an author versus being a publisher? Um, well, most authors are, are, you know, pretty consistently ticked off with their publisher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of both sides of the desk, you know, you, you know, but uh, seriously, I mean, it's just, you know what, it's being an author for me is an awful lot of freedom. You know, you, 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 you know, I've heard, you've heard the cliche, you know, when you're, you know, when you work in the film world, you film world, you, you know, you're work by committee, no matter, no matter what, whether you're indie or studio. And, you know, when you're writing prose, when you're writing short stories and novels, you, you kind of play God, you're the, you're the boss. And uh, even if you have an editor, um, you know, you, that's if you do, that's kind of like the only other voice that will poke their head into the room and tell you things. But even then, um, you know, if you believe passionate about your story, you can always pick it up and go elsewhere. So, yeah, uh, being a writer for me has always been about freedom and kind of breaking rules and doing, you know, doing what you feel passionately about. Whereas being a publisher, man, you have to you have to. Um, if you want to be successful and you want to last, you have to kind of treat it as a business the best you can. And I've never been a businessman. I've always been, I've always had lots of ideas about marketing. And so I've always kind of excelled at that part of it. But, you know, man, keeping subscriber files and selling ad space and, and working with printers and getting, you know, comparative bids and, and layout artists and all the rest of it. That was always, you know, like I said, you talk about an adventure. It was, uh, it was a huge learning process. You learn a lot by your mistakes, I would assume, with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what, there, you know, one of the things, I, I tell people this, and they always kind of look at me cross-eyed, but I'm like, I, I, you know, I grew up as an athlete. I went to college on a lacrosse scholarship. I played baseball before that and basketball. And, and uh, I think that background really helped me because, um, you know, when you play at a, at a high level or, or, you know, you're used to being coached, you're used to going out and, you know, having a game that they write about you in the newspaper. But at, when it comes time to watch and film, you're mainly focusing on what you did wrong, not what you did right. Um, and you learn to take that criticism and use it as, you know, an incentive to make yourself better. And, and I really believe that helped me because you you really hit the nail on the head. It's it's all about making mistakes and doing your best not to repeat them and, and learning from them and uh, minimizing them. And, and, and even after 30 something years, you know, still making mistakes. I tell new, new, new publishers all the time who, who ask for advice. I'm just like, it's part of the process, embrace it. It's kind of a badge of honor to make these mistakes and do these things. And, and uh, you know, you have to have that stubborn side of you that believes in what you're doing. And it just says, well, I'm gonna screw up, but I'll be back, you know? And, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that. You know, a lot of very talented people, you know, they make a mistake or two and they're gone, they give up. Yeah. 
it's kind of like that whole when when sometimes people look at a star and they go, oh, you know, they're a star because of their talent. And it's like, well, they're a star not necessarily just because they're talent. You know, it, there is a degree of tenacity and will and they want it so badly that you see, you know, landfills full of people who who are incredibly talented who just did not have the makeup to move oh, yeah. down that road. And I'm sure you've seen it all, both as an athlete and in the world of publishing and as an author. Um, I mean, because I'm even sure... Even in, in the movie world, yeah. dealing with actors and directors and uh, some, of the, some of the most uh, immediate bonds that have formed between me and, and people working in different industries, like I said, a lot of actors and a lot of people in the film industry, is that understanding that, um, you know... I, I know you're on, you were on the cover of cover of Vanity Fair last month, but I know you went through hell to get there. And and essentially, you know, you have these conversations, and at some point, you get that point across, and they look at you like, yeah, you really do know, don't you? And there's that element of trust that is immediately put in place and understanding where it's like anyone who has had any amount of success, significant amount of success, has battled and has and has been knocked down more times than they've been told yes. Um, and that that's important. I mean, that, you know, when you just said that, it, like a light bulb goes off because I'm like, man, that's where some of my some of my best relationships have been forged. It's just that understanding that it's not all it's not completely about talent. You know, there's luck and all that in there. But the number one thing is usually perseverance and, and just sticking you know, through it. Yeah. Well, I want to get into the world of digital because obviously digital is everywhere. We've been living in this digital world now for, I guess, you know, at least 20 years. Um, as far as getting authors' voices out there, would you say, how would you say that digital has helped those authors get their voices out into the world? Oh man, you know, as far as marketing and, and the ability to the ability to reach a large number of people, the ability to market yourself in a professional way because of the you know because of easier design programs and, and all that for you know for online and digitally. It's just, you know, I, I, people laugh when I tell them, I say, look, the first five years I spent working on Cemetery Dance, longer than that, really. Um, I, the, the majority of my time was spent on the telephone and sitting at a coffee table, folding flyers, stuffing them in envelopes, sealing the envelopes, putting stamps on them and putting mailing labels because there was no Internet. There were no digital mailing lists. I had two ways to get the words out about my business. One was direct mail which I just, you know, described. It's not glamorous. I watched more episodes of uh, MASH and Andy Griffith's show and all that when I, when I was doing this. And, and then, and it was, a, it was an interesting part of the business. I mean, it was an interesting part of the process rather because you would, you know, I would buy a mailing list or I would rent a mailing list. Um, I, you know, I knew from day one because of this, that, uh, that accumulating my own mailing list of active, interested customers was, was, the backbone to our business so you know i ran into any mailing list i could that i thought was <coughs> valuable um you know i bought a lot from booksellers and other publishers um and then you would sit there and you would put anywhere you know some of them were 240 people some of them were 100 some of them were 3,000. um and you would put all these flyers in the mail and eventually catalogs you know that we had made and you would put them in the mail and you would just pray that checks would show up that people would respond and there were times when you know i sunk all that money into postage and stationery and envelopes and all that and three orders would come back you know and i would make back two percent of the money and then there were times when the p.o box would just be stuffed and you were like you know like the you know the person rolling around in bed and dollar and hundred dollar bills except <laughs> i was like pulling around in quarters uh, <laughs> So yeah, it was it was interesting, and then the second way was display ads. And when I came along in '88, it was at the end of the horror shows run, um, so I was only able to advertise in there a couple times. And then the big display ad that we got fortunate that we got lucky with was the nobody knew it was the very last issue of the Twilight Zone magazine, um, and we took out a half page ad. We used we used my wife's uh, um, college loan. Um, we used like 600 or 800 dollars from that and uh and we ran a half page ad in twilight zone 
and it sold hundreds of subscriptions and it ended up being the final issue of twilight zone so instead of being yanked out of bookstores to put the new issue in there two months later it just sat in there until they all sold um so that that ad ended up being a gold mine for us but that again just talking about these little things shows you how different it is from this new digital age where yeah. you know you can press a button and boom you're you're beautifully designed full color ad as opposed to the black and white photocopy that yep. staples <laughs> Um, flyer that I was mailing, um, you know, is sent out to everybody and they can read it on their phones, their iPads and their computers. So completely different animal nowadays. Yeah, definitely. It looks a lot more professional. That's for sure. I remember those days of like fanzines and stuff and you get these horribly photocopied, you know, pieces of paper, but it was great because it was fun. Cause it was like another world. You're like getting, you know, information and things that, you know, you normally may not have been privy to. So it was kind of cool. Oh, man. I walked around, yeah. I walked around my senior year in college with my head like in the clouds, thinking, "Oh my God, you know, th- these these things that are coming from all over the small press magazines and from all over the country. Some of them are actually buying my stories, and and uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, they're just very neat, and and uh, you saw a lot of passion in them, even in the really crummy reduced ones. Well, you know, self publishing is something that's always interested me, and I would love to get your thoughts on that. Um, what would you tell potential authors out there about self-publishing? Um, you know what? I'm asked every week, and, and my advice is always the same. And it's like, you know, in the beginning, there was really this stigma attached to it, um, mainly because it was usually poorly done. You know, bad covers, uh, you know, no proofreading, very little editorial work. And people were just, you know, the people who were choosing to self-publish were just slapping something together. A lot like some of the early small press magazines, you know, and, and put out there. Um, but as technology improved and as, you know, the New York p- traditional publishing industry kind of imploded, you know, um, more and more legit, you know, writers um, started, you know, kind of choosing that path and, uh, they started, you know, uh, you know, having better covers designed and, uh, you know, better back covers that, you know, completely professional. Um, you know, they hired editors and proofreaders and all of a sudden, you know, they were able to publish their books, reap 100% of the profits. And in a lot of cases it looked even better than the New York title. So the biggest thing with, with self-publishing, I think now is, you know, just how much there is out there. So you have to do whatever you can to, you know, make to help yourself stand out from the crowd. And that goes above and beyond those things I just mentioned, you know, a professional cover and all that stuff. Um, You know, you want to look just as good or better than the books that are in the bookstore. Um, And then I always say, you know, the going above and beyond usually comes into making sure that you're able to to have some funds to promote your book, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on, uh, you know, now you can do it on Amazon and some of the other places. But uh, no one's going to buy your book, no matter how good it is and and how great it looks, if it's one in, you know, 750,000 that were released that year and you're not somehow finding the way to promote it and get it in readers hands so i wanted to ask you about um working with stephen king how did you end up working with him oh man it was a long it was a long road be, um you know and there was never any intention to, to 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 well you're talking about working with him as far as publishing yeah there was intention right from the beginning mm-hmm. i sent him the very first issue of, of cemetery dance back in in 88 um, I sent him the next issue and the one after that and then and one when we started publishing books. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure many of those uh, mailings were accompanied by, you know, very corny, cheesy letters, but absolutely heartfelt and genuine saying, ah, you're the reason I'm doing this, you know, Uncle Steve. And uh, for you, I'd be, you know, I'd be, you know, selling vacuum cleaners or whatever. But yeah, I... Uh, he was such a huge influence that uh, I, I just knew from day one that I wanted to have him involved in some way if I was ever that fortunate. And uh, so I sent him everything up there to Bangor and he was always very kind, very receptive. Um, you know, the, the first real contact I had with his office as far as, you know, mutual uh, correspondence was he uh, he was kind enough to send a promotional blurb like in year two or something, year three, maybe. Nice. Uh, the, um, and then I think for the fall in 91, 
so three years in, uh, he sent us an original story called Shattery Teeth to publish in the magazine. And that really, you know, we had recently gone to full color covers and, and expanded beyond the little bookshops and diamond you know, distribution into comic shops, into uh, some newsstand retail and, and some bookstore, um, you know, uh, placement. Um, but having an, an original Stephen King story kicked up the print run and kicked up, you know, the attention that we got. And then when I started doing books, um, you know, I just sent them copies and, and you know, periodically would say, hey, if uh, we'd love to work with you if you ever, you know, have something. And then, you know, like eight or nine years down the line, he, he sent me uh, from a Buick 8 to to publish as a limited and it really went from there you know we've you know we published other books from him and lots of stories and anthologies and collections that kind of thing and um yeah i just always very supportive marcia who was his one of his assistants at the office was always very kind to us and and uh people always said you know well how come you know your 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 yes rate with steve was a lot higher than you know the rest of the fields and i'm always like you know i i I just always, you know, there was no secret thing. You know, I didn't have like pictures of Steve naked with a farm animal. Or anything. <laughs> you know, I was always very understanding and, and I never had any sense of entitlement. And later, as I got to know, you know, the folks up in Bangor later, as far as the office staff and stuff, you know, I, I found out that there was a lot of entitlement from other people. You know, there was a lot of that sense of, hey, I've been doing this for 10 years now. And, you know, why haven't you worked with me? And uh, I never had that. I know. Ne- doesn't make sense to me it's you know i was always thrilled when he said yes and understood when he said no and i always made it really clear that hey you know you've got no reason to want to work with a schmuck like me but if you do i'm here and i think that that went a long way to uh to uh you know making it the path a little easier as the years went on and i also and I also know this from speaking with him later, you know, one on one that, you know, he knew my heart was in the right place and that I was doing this for the right reasons. Um, you know, nobody gets in to, to, you know, make a fortune, which I certainly wasn't. Um, but the, the genuine love for the horror genre and, and the, you know, suspense and crime and mystery fields was there. And, and I think that went a long way also. I was going to say he probably saw that in, you know, right off the bat and was, you know, knowing him, I, I have always heard really good things with him and how he responds to, to people who come up to him with stuff. And the fact that you can mail him uh, uh, any of his books and he'll sign it and send it back to you. Yeah, not anymore, but I mean, because he got overwhelmed. But if he did that for, I mean, had to be at least a decade. And you know, no, I mean, any, any kind story you've ever heard about the guy is, uh, I can vouch for very generous, very kind, um, very smart, very funny, all those words to describe him. Um, and in many ways, you know, I always tell Marsha, uh, who's retired from the office now, I'm like, I always tell him, you know, you were my guardian angel because for years I was dealing strictly with her. Um, you know, I would get a phone message from Steve or a letter or something like that. But it was always Marsha who I was asking because back then I didn't have his phone number or his email. Um, it was just, you know, business. And, and that's the interesting thing is then eventually over the years, that business relationship kind of turned into a friendship. And, you know, we started texting and emailing a lot and, and never about business, anything. You know, if I wanted to ask something, you know, about uh, reprinting a story or, hey, I'm doing this anthology, you might have something new. That always went through, you know, his agent or through uh, his office. Uh, you know, we were just emailing about sports and books and movies and our dogs and family, that kind of thing. Is there anything you learned from him as an author from being around and talking to him? Not just from talking to him. I, I mean, I learned from him. Uh, I, I certainly learned from his books um, even before I realized that I was learning from his books. You know, I, I, I think um, I just did an interview couple days ago uh, a written interview actually and and one of the questions was um oh uh what was it i can't remember how the the question was phrased but it kind of circled back to you know that initial attraction that i had to steve's work was was because he was writing about people and places that i knew and even though i grew up in suburban maryland he grew up in suburban slash you know kind of rural maine um we, we both grew up in small towns and the, there's something to that old saying that, you know, all small towns are at, at their heart, they're, they're alike, um, you know, and, and that's what I fell in love with his stories is, is and, and, and again, it took me a while to realize that, but I was reading about people that I kind of knew, um, you know, from the wrong side of the tracks, the right side of the tracks, 
um you know they all you know a lot of them had secrets that's why their curtains were closed and that's why you know you as a kid you kind of knew these secrets because you knew the shortcuts and and every once in a while you heard things and saw things that that the grown-ups didn't and all that kind of that that kind of uh atmosphere that comes out of the king books uh you know i lived it and and, and eventually, you know, started writing about it just like him. So, I, yeah, I mean, as far, and, and then when I started writing with him, I learned a ton, obviously. And, and just from from being there, you know, in the presence of, as things happened in, in life, you know, time, um, that, that was very neat. Let's get into your new novel, Becoming the Boogeyman. Um, this is a sequel to Chasing the Boogeyman which uh, has a very interesting premise, to say the least. I know the book went into second printing before its initial release, um, but for those who haven't read it yet, what can you tell them about the first novel, Chasing the Boogeyman? Oh, um, you know what? It is, I was just talking about small towns and, and you know hometowns and that kind of thing, and, and I had never, I'd written lots of short stories that kind of touched on, on Edgewood, Maryland, the place where I grew up. Um, and actually more than I kind of realized, because it wasn't until I was putting together my, my latest collection that I realized, you know, man, <clears throat> you wrote about, uh, you know, you mentioned the word Edgewood, the name Edgewood, and you wrote about weeping willow trees, and you wrote about, you know, w- uh, creeks called Winter's Run, and, and all these different stories, yet you didn't even realize it until you were assembling them together into this collection. And that's because I, you know, I grew up with a big weeping willow tree in my side yard, and Winter's Run is where we fish down the street, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I always, you know, people always ask me, when are you going to write a novel set, you know, in your small town, um, in your small hometown? And, and I always say, well, you know, it's coming. And I always envisioned it would be a big, hulking, you know, scary horror novel like It or Dan Simmons' Summer at Night, um, both of which I love. Um, and instead, it ended up being Chasing the Boogeyman, this kind of lean and mean crime story uh, or thriller um, about a serial killer who, who comes to my town. And uh, the initial idea was just this, you know, faceless narrator who who is coming home after graduating from college and is going to live at his parents' house for like the next six or nine months until because he's engaged until his wedding, you know, save some money. And I love that dynamic of this 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 young adult who's kind of on the threshold of, of full adulthood and responsibility and marriage living in his old bedroom, you know, kind of staring at the window at the ghost of his childhood. And uh, that, that the dynamic that that you know immediately put in place, and uh, by the time I had gotten four or five pages into the introduction to the book, I realized, all right, Rich, you know, you're writing about yourself, and this time you, you, it's going to be about you. You know, you're going to be the character, and uh, a very odd decision. I mean, I'd never. My agent was floored because she's like, you're like the most behind the scenes client I have. You don't like going to conventions, or you don't like going to book shows, and. I'm like, no, man, I'm a homebody and, and I, you know, I, I, I'm just fine not doing interviews and all that. Um, but this is the way that the story really wanted to be told. So that's that's how it happened. And, and I ended up it was me. I really did come home, you know, so essentially, you know, 60 percent of the book is true. Um, people always ask, you know, you wrote a lot about your childhood and your family and your friends and your siblings. You know, how much of that is true? And I, I, I say, you know, like 98 percent of it's true. When I get to the murders and, and what's happening to my small town, that's where I, you know, I made stuff up. So, I mean, when you're when you're kind of blending that world of reality and fantasy, how, how do you walk that tightrope? I mean, because you're talking about real people. I'm assuming you you changed their names or nope. no? Did you? Nope. Nope, I use the okay. same names. I just put Simon and Schuster crazy because you know, <laughs> they're, they're poor legal department. I had quite a few phone calls with them in the beginning. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because I'm a big true crime fan when it's done well, and that's how I envisioned the book. And, and what I wanted to do, as soon as I realized I was writing about Richard Chismar on Hanson Road in Edgewood, Maryland, during the summer of 88 when he graduated and moved home getting ready to marry you know like i said nine months later um and i was the magazine was you know i was i was working on my second issue and i was writing stories and trying to sell them and all of that is you know true stuff and uh once i realized that i I thought well you know what i'm gonna write this in the format of a true crime book 
um, I'm going to write like this really happened and I'm going to try to Blair Witch the audience. This was my original plan. I, I did not want it to say a novel on the front of the cover. I did not want there to be a disclaimer in the beginning that said, you know, hey, this is made up. Um, the, both things my publisher insisted on. Um, I wanted to Blair Witch it. My youngest son, I mean, my oldest son um, is a filmmaker. We've, we've done some short projects together and, and had really great success with them and, you know, festivals and that kind of thing. And, and I wanted him to do a documentary like they did for Blair Witch, you know, playing it real, playing it like this is the real deal, a behind the scenes kind of thing. And so I wanted him to go do that. And I was going to plant face, fake newspaper articles and the whole stuff online so that when people read it, they would go online and Google and they would find things. Um, and yeah, the legal department squashed that in like a day. Um, <laughs> That's so brilliant though. I mean, I love your passion for putting this together. That, is, that would have been so amazing. <laughs> it was so much fun. I mean, I, that's why I said I had more fun writing this book than, than should be allowed. Um, you know, both of my parents have been gone for, for quite a while. So uh, my parents were back while I was writing this book. I was, you know, I, I wrote about some very, uh, personal stuff that I've never written about. Um, and, and just the daily goings of that time there. And again, that, that interesting dynamic of, you know, I'm 21, I was a young graduate, so I think it was 21 or 22, um, you know, working my butt off at this stuff that I have no idea if it's gonna succeed. And then, hey, you know, five o'clock rolls around, I'm down at the dinner table with my mom and dad. <laughs> um, so it's just an interesting time in my life. And then to introduce this, this killer who's kind of holding the hound, town hostage, you know, kind of like the town that dreaded sundown. Just, it, you know, it's a very old fashioned campfire type story. And, and I remember thinking that right before the book came out because it, it had a lot of buzz. And I remember thinking, oh God, you know, it really is just, just like this old fashioned campfire story about this kid from Edgewood, you know, what, why are people gonna care about that? And, and that was the wonderful surprise is that I immediately heard when the book was released from people who had who had essentially lived the same childhood, and a lot of them had forgotten. I have so many messages from people who said, "I had absolutely forgotten popping tar bubbles out in the road in the summer and having that hot liquid squirt up on your hand," and, and, until I read your book. And other people said, "I forgot all about throwing crab apples at cars or jumping <laughs> ramps on bikes," and and that was a neat realization that. And, and it was a good reminder for me as a writer that, you know, hey, even when you are writing about your own little world, you really aren't because that's your job as a writer is to, is to entertain and connect. And you're going to and, and if, if you're very fortunate, you're going to find that audience that is going to connect with what you did. As long as you told it in an honest way, they're going to they're going to find it and connect. So that was that was a, a great kind of app realization for me. And, and um, yeah. And, and, and the best thing is, is a lot of people, I mean, a lot still believed it was true i had some angry people at the end who said i feel like you you know bamboozled me and pulled the rung out from under me and i wanted i never responded but i wanted to say isn't that what you paid your 25 bucks for <laughs> what to kind of be taken away and transported and it, if you got fooled it's not my fault because it says novel right on the damn yeah. cover um <laughs> but then and but then tons of people said i saw the novel i knew it was freaking uh, you know, work of fiction. I read the disclaimer, which I refused to write, by the way. My editor wrote that because I was like, I'm not doing it. You can put it in, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> and even they said, you know, I stopped three or four times and I Googled. And, and usually because there's pictures in the book at the end of each chapter, I, I took pictures. I used actors and friends and I took pictures of the places and in some cases the, the victims or the family members or friends. And I put them at the end of each chapter to really reinforce what they had just read. And that, like, it works. I can't, like I said, I can't tell you how many people said I Googled it anyway. That's so cool. I love it. I love it. Yeah, cool. Well, without giving too much away about your newest novel, uh, what can you tell us about it? Um, you know what? It picks up. Um, you know, it, it, it picks up pretty much where the other one left off. But well, I say that, and then you know, the original novel took place in '88. Um, it, it, it jumps in time, um, and, and I don't think this is much of a spoiler. It, at the very end in the epilogue, it jumps um, quite a few years into the future. But, but like I said, originally set in 88, so the future was like almost present time um, with new events related to the murders. Um, this new book picks up 
very shortly after those new events. So it's a direct sequel. It's, uh, you know, I'm still the main character. Um, you know, my main family, my, my family has a, an even larger role this time. Um, it's, you know, it's very accurate. It's the, the pictures that are in the book of, of the house I live in and the property we live at. And it's uh, set in Bel Air, Maryland, instead of predominantly Edgewood. There's still a lot of Edgewood in my hometown in it. But, you know, we're only 15 minutes apart. Um, so it's very much another hometown book. And bad things are happening and people trying to figure it out and how it's all connected. And I'm caught in the middle. And, and you know, I have I've been a New York Times bestseller now. And. You know, I've had movies made, and so I'm in a very fortunate position. But at the same time, there's lots of people out there saying, "Oh, you know, he's living in the house that the boogeyman built." And it, it's it's the second one is very much an exploration of, of kind of our fascination, side of fascination with with bad guys and uh, and and you know cr- you know true crime and 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 kind of you know shines a flashlight on that. Or, you know where there should be more boundaries and especially as creators are we playing into making these people almost folk heroes you know they're, they're you can buy a t-shirt with charlie manson's face on it and, and and that kind of thing so it's uh you know it's got some it's got some serious themes at its at its heart but it's still very much a campfire story and uh creeping in parts i hope and and uh kind of nostalgic in other parts so yeah hopefully people dig it i'm, I'm excited um, are you on social media if anybody wants to follow you? I am. I went kicking and screaming however many years ago, <laughs> and now I actually love it because for the guy who doesn't really like leaving his house that much, I uh, so yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram, and I'm also a little bit on TikTok. But uh, it's been great. I mean, I I hear horror stories all the time, like oh my god, psychos and this and that, and I'm like, I think in you know 15 years I've blocked maybe 10 people across all the different social media i've had really really great support and um it, it's just been neat to kind of grow with them and they've, they've you know without them I, I don't know what i'd be doing so it, it's it's a fun relationship well i know we all can't wait for becoming the boogeyman it's going to be coming out on october 10th uh, richard this was really fantastic I, I i had such a great time with this interview i i really would love to do this again down the road for uh, your next novel or anything Absolutely. else you have come out with. Really, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thanks for having me. I had a good time. Richard's just an amazing guy. Awesome guy. I had so much fun talking to him. Uh, we almost didn't have the interview. <laughs> almost didn't have the interview happen. I don't know what's going on here in the graveyard. I'm having all kinds of weird bugs happening. Um, it uh, it was one of those things where uh, he was not hearing me. And it wasn't no, it wasn't the mute button. Don't 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 go down that road. Um, although that has come back to bite me a few times. No, it was just one of those weird things that. Uh, well, let's just say it was operator error, which kinds that which tends to happen here a lot lately on the Graveyard Show podcast. You think I've done this once or twice before, and I'd know what to do, but apparently I don't. But uh, make sure you check out Becoming the Boogeyman, uh, available now. Uh, wherever you buy your books and definitely let me know what you think when you read it all right the youtube channel graveyard show podcast youtube channel is where it's at and um as i mentioned earlier the podcast well you get uh you get the podcast and um you also get the gys classic podcast but you don't get other stuff like catacombs of horror Uh, which uh, is my video production where I talk about movies and scenes that I like in movies, among other things. Uh, The latest edition is being edited right now. It will be my favorite scenes from the 1972 vampire classic, Blackula. And uh, you can find the other five on YouTube as well. The, um, The five of them are, is Evil Dead the greatest horror movie franchise of all time? I match it up against five other franchises and I set up rules and uh, build my house of horror franchises. Uh, there's also my favorite scenes from Count Yorga Vampire, which is a tremendous hit. Uh, my favorite scenes from The Return of Count Yorga. Halloween 4, my favorite scenes. Uh, why I think it's the second most important Halloween film in the series outside the original. And the unfortunate missed opportunity that the series um, 
should have taken and did not. And the first one is with uh, David Weiner joins me on the program, and we talk about 1980s horror, and we look at four categories and pick what we think best represents 1980s horror in those four categories. So check that out on YouTube, Catacombs of Horror. Then I do uh, what I call the open box show. Uh, the Caretaker Reveals, where I show different items that I have uh, from the world of horror and sci-fi that I think might interest you. They're very short. They're like three to five minutes. Most of them. Um, and uh, you can find BC's Video Vault, uh, old, um, vid- old video reviews from the Graveyard Show podcast from 2009 and 10, among many other things you can find on YouTube. So check that out. On the next Graveyard Show podcast, I'm going to be joined by the director of the new movie, The Bellkeeper. Colton Tran is going to join me. We're going to talk about the new movie. And if you want to check out the trailer, you can also go to the Graveyard Show podcast and you can find the trailer for The Bellkeeper there as well. So in the meantime, uh, I will see you here very, very soon. It's going to be dropping in a few days. So uh, a lot more coming your way. And then I have one more original interview after that, maybe two, depending, that I will close out the month of October. And then I'm going to go on a long vacation. (laughs) Okay. All right. Enjoy the season, my friends. And I look forward to seeing you again here very soon. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.